and then you try to fight that. And if you fight it in your own power, how well is that going to work? It won't. It won't work. You will fail. Now, what you need to hold that thought, what you need to understand is that some of us have become very proficient at holding that back. This is why God did not give us the ability to read each other's minds. Okay? Because I could be smiling in your face and having you on the back, and if you read my mind, I'm killing you. That's fallen human nature, right? Right? Yes. Now listen. How many of you that are married have never really ever thought about really just hurting your spouse? Verbally, sometimes even physically. You may never do it. But you tell me the thought never crossed your mind. How many times your kids fired off to you? The first thought in your head was a pow. But what keeps you from doing that? Well, I don't want my church to find out that that's the kind of person I am, so I don't do that. <laughs> that's your reason. That's not okay, for some people that is the reason. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Other people, it's this is not what God wants. So I've learned not to do it because that's not what God wants, but how do I keep my head from thinking that? Okay? So you understand, we, as Ray said, need to be other-centered. But we may think we're there, we may think that's what we're doing, but we're doing that from a selfish point of view. Self-deception is the strongest, blindingest evil that the devil gives to us. Amen. How clear and easy is it to see the faults of your brothers and sisters, and yet how hard is it to see those same faults in yourself? Amen. <laughs> I like that, Doc. Now here, here's something even harder to deal with. What do you do when you see those things in you, and you want victory over those things, and sometimes you get it, and other times you don't. You try to deny it, you try to justify it, and say, well, it's not that bad. I'm not doing it that bad. Um, that's where the ethnocentricity comes in, the individual. And there's always conflict in, in a living world. We will have inner conflict as well as outer conflict. And we will not live without it. It's there. That's why you have to have Christ in your heart that makes you survive all of these trials and tribulations. When Christ went, he didn't go to his brother, he went alone and meditated with his father. Yes, yes. See, Doc, what you're talking about is what the Bible says that the in the, in the King James, it says that the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit lusteth against the flesh. Newer versions, it's war. The flesh wars against the spirit, the spirit wars against the flesh. You always have this conflict. Okay? <laughs> conflict. Inner conflict, outer conflict. How do we deal with conflict? Ray, you like conflict, right? I love it. Me too. Some of us, conflict is just something to thrive off of. Conflict to us is something that needs to be handled right away. As quickly, as hard as necessary, no matter what the consequences are, to make sure it's taken care of. And then you move on to the next thing. And most of the time you leave a wake of destruction in your path. Some of us don't like conflict at all, and we avoid it at all costs. Have you ever heard the term passive-aggressive? Oh, yeah. yeah. Most dangerous people you ever meet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're passive to your face, Ooh. and then they're aggressive behind your back. Okay? At least the aggressive person is aggressive to your face. Amen. Okay? You know where they're coming from. The passive aggressive one. Who's the one you gotta watch out for? <laughs> your enemy is the only person you can really trust, and you know he's gonna get to the first chance he's got. Your friend, you never know when you're gonna stab him. I had a man when I first came into the church, and I was working with him at the hospital. Uh, and he was a uh, he was a career criminal before he turned his life around. And when he started to meet Christians, 
and he worked at the hospital and started to meet Christians from the hospital. He told me flat out, he said, I'd rather deal with the guys that I grew up with, the criminals, because at least I knew them, I knew what they would do. But you Christians, he goes, you smile at my face, but you stab me in the back. And I realized that what he said had some truth to it. But he wasn't talking about true converted Christians who know Jesus Christ. He's talking about actors. Hypocrites. Role players. The question is, is which one of those are you? In the book of Revelation, Jesus gives seven letters to seven churches. If Jesus was to write a letter to the church of New Smyrna Beach today, what would it say? Would he have words of commendation or words of condemnation? What you need to understand is, think about this. In the book of Job, it tells you that all the sons of God came together and he stood before God himself. And who was in the midst of it? And God is looking at them. Why is he looking at them? Why did they appear before him? Why don't you think about this? Before the devil turned into the devil, who was he? Lucifer, a covering cherub, right? And the Bible says that he was made perfect in all of his ways until what? Iniquity was found in him. How was iniquity found in him? Did the other angels catch him lying? <coughs> all the sons of God came before him to stand before God, and God is able to read the heart. And so at some point in time, in eternity past, Lucifer was standing before God and God was looking at him and God was reading his very heart and his mind and iniquity was found in him. God knows everything you do. God knows your thoughts. God knows your motives. He knows why you do the things you do. As Doc said, we can hide these things, but you can't hide them from God. So if God was to write a letter to the church today, knowing our hearts, knowing our motives, what would he say? Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 524.